Good afternoon. My name is Dennis Rain. I'm the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator with Moraga Rinda Fire District, and I'm also helping with the public information side of the North Arinda Shader Fuel Break Project. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming today. I'd like to introduce Chief Fire Chief David Winokur from the Moraga Rinda Fire District. Good afternoon, and thank you all very much for coming. I understand on a, on a weekday afternoon there are other things you could be doing now. Uh, the intent of today's slides, we're going to walk through an overview of the project. Uh, this project developed very quickly, and as consequently, there has not been a whole lot of information spread about it, and we're certainly committed to transparency and want to make sure you know everything that we know. Uh, but understand that this project was initially proposed back in December, or November actually, as something much smaller. And then as a result of the governor's request for the 45-day report, our partners at CAL FIRE took our original proposal, significantly expanded it, and it made it through the 45-day process, which was um, compressed, to say the least, and, and not all that transparent. So we didn't have a whole lot of awareness of what the state was doing with our proposal. On the other hand, uh, this is a gift horse that we do not want to look too closely in the mouth because the opportunity, although the process was not normal, the opportunity is still there and we have a tremendous amount of local control to make this project be what we want it to be while it aligns with all of our local concerns and requirements. I do want to note our partners uh, at East Bay Mud, East Bay Parks, on whose land a lot of this work will be done, as well as in Con Fire, whose jurisdiction the eastern portions of this project will go through. So the partnership between these four entities is what makes this possible, and while MOFD is in the lead, this is 100% a partnership between our four agencies. Um, to orient you to the problem, or to the, the map, if you will, um, you'll note uh, here on the map, we see Highway 24 running east-west along the bottom of the map, and then the two large reservoirs of San Pablo and Briones up top. Uh, the project runs from Akalani's High, just west of Akalani's High, at Pleasant Hill and Highway 24, up the ridge line through Brioni's Park to the intersection of Happy Valley and um, Sundown Terrace, up and over Happy Valley to Bear Creek, Bear Creek west out to Inspiration Point at the top of Wildcat Canyon, and then on north-south axis uh, along the ridge line from Inspiration Point. The vast majority of this work is intended to be shaded fuel breaks. Uh, I say that deliberately and I ask for all of your help in messaging that with anyone you talk to. People are very casually calling this a fire break. And this is not a fire break. A fire break is something very different. This is a shaded fuel break that for the vast majority of the project will leave the existing canopy intact both for best practice from an environmental standpoint to minimize the impact on special status species, as well as retard the future growth of understory, which removal of the tree canopy would encourage by allowing sunlight to reach the floor. So we will largely be leaving mature trees, healthy trees intact and focusing on understory removal along the route to the project. So for a brief review, uh, this is the fire history in the local area. And I apologize, the slide's a little faded here, but you see the Highway 24 indication on the upper right quadrant. Highway 24 runs from right to left with a slight downward angle. On the top there, in 1923, that was the Berkeley Hills fire, burned over 60 city blocks, stopped at the intersection of Hearst and Shattuck. When the wind stopped, it would have continued to have burned had the wind not died. The 1905 fire coming out of the watershed, running down into what is present day Orinda. The 1991 tunnel fire, the 1970 fish fire. All of those were Diablo wind events that occurred in the fall. And, and so the reason I use this slide is to orient to the threat that we are primarily concerned about, which is a fire coming off of the watershed lands to our north and to the northeast of the communities in the East Bay that will align all of that wilderness space, all of that vegetation and untamed natural areas to our north will align those with a very dry, high-speed wind coming out of the north and northeast in conjunction with the Diablo wind event. That is the fire we are primarily concerned about for the regional impact of a mega fire. It is possible for there to be a fire coming from the west. That'd be 1937 is a good example. But any fire from the west, which is going, any fire in this area is going to be a wind-driven fire, is necessarily going to be limited by the onset of the fog that any wind from the west brings inevitably. And the reason that 1937 fire doesn't look like the big blob that all the other major fires look like, the reason it is an intact ellipse and that, in 1937, that was not fire suppression efforts that put that fire out. That was a fog bank that put a big wet party on top of that fire and put it out. That's why it never expanded. So the threat we are primarily concerned about, and this project is intended to address, is the threat of a major wind-driven fire coming from the north and the northeast in alignment with a Diablo wind event. So 
this is intended to show uh, exactly where the project is going to run. And the, the different colors are indicative that the project's been broken up in, into a series of parcels, both to encourage project management and to assure we have aligned the best practices for environmental considerations to each of these parcels. And we don't just have a big blanket prescription that applies to the whole thing. This will allow the project managers to very precisely and with a surgical precision identify which parcel is being worked on, what specifications will be in use on that parcel, and to ensure that parcel has been signed off and that all the preparatory work, both environmental and biological and archeological, that must occur before any physical work occurs has been completed for that parcel. So as I alluded to, if you go to the, the right side of the slide, that's the beginning of the parklands just west of Akalani's High School. There's a very narrow band following the ridge line through the Brioni's Park system that follows existing fire trail in that area. In that area, the work will be primarily reduction of annual grasses, targeted removal of brush as it is permitted in accordance with the requirements for Alameda Whipsnake habitat conservation, as well as on the north side, removal of understory underneath the mature oak canopy that is currently in place there. That will continue up until the, um, the end of Wellesley Drive, which is where that narrow band uh, starts to expand out into light blue, right about there. From there, the, the project will move down through the Russell Tree Reserve, working on understory removal and removal of dead and dying trees in that area. Here, coming down along the Happy Valley uh, Road from Sundown Terrace to Orinda View, removal of the decadent and dying trees that are overlaying the road, which is the only evacuation route for residents of Orinda View. Coming along Orinda uh, View and then down the existing fire trail system past the East Bay Mud Reservoir through here, doing understory work, uh, clearing out the understory, and then removal of the overlapping canopy through trimming and limbing that is currently overlapping the fire trail in that area. Coming down along Happy Valley through here, uh, that upper section where the road is overgrown and encroached upon by vegetation and lots of trees, some of which are currently overhanging the road. There'll be work through there to open up the roadside. And then down through here along Bear Creek, this will be either understory in the areas that have trees and then brush and annual grass removal to expand the existing roadway to make sure that the vegetation on the shoulders has been treated to make that a more effective fire road, in this case, that will prevent the spread of fire uh, across the, the road. Moving through here in the Sleepy Hollow Swim and Tennis area, the Bear um, Ridge area and Sand Hill, working roadside shoulder clearance. Coming down towards Sleepy Hollow Elementary School and the, Brioni, the face of the Brioni's Dam, Duffel Parcel, and the eastern sides of San Pablo Reservoir. These areas will all be understory and brush removal. This area, these are uh, an old Monterey pine plantation, will be removal of dead and dying trees to open up the spacing. Those trees were overplanted. They did not get the mortality rates they had planned for. That will thin those out to in increase the health of the forest there. Uh, around Wagner Ranch School, opening up the understory uh, grass and targeted brush and dead tree removal in the nature area. Coming through East Bay Mudlands here, um, up along the hillside, primarily grass and brush removal. Along Wildcat Canyon, uh, for anyone who's driven that recently, we're, we're talking about the south shoulder of the road. And on that south shoulder of the road, uh, that is overgrown. There's a high degree of duff on the ground, decadent and dying brush, down limbs and so forth to create ladder fuels. And that, is, that area, in my opinion, is a poster child for what the exclusion of fire over the last 120 years has resulted in. While photosynthesis has continued during that period, photosynthesis has allowed deposition to grow the fuel stocks in that area to tremendous levels, which means we cannot stop a fire along Wildcat Canyon in the current environment because the fuel loads are so high. So that is an area where we're, we'll be making initial entry with hand crews to remove the ladder fuels, clear fuels away from the base of the trees to reduce scorch height, and then making targeted use of prescribed fire to clean up the understory in the appropriate manner. This is an environment that is adapted to the introduction of fire on a three to five year cycle until we interrupted that cycle with our settlement. Uh, coming up to uh, this area through El Toyonal, this is work here, working on a shaded fuel break to perform maintenance on that and work that East Bay Mud did approximately five years ago to open that up to reduce the threat of wildfire encroaching on the limited evacuation routes from El Toyonal. Same here along existing fire trail work. And then working up here on the eastern flanks of Volmer Peak, 
to open up the brush and, and do fuels management there that would reduce the threat of a fire moving past Wildcat up and over Vollmer Peak and threatening the communities to our west. Uh, coming back to up here to the top of Wildcat um, at Inspiration Point, they're East Bay, on East Bay mudlands, who work in the eucalyptus groves, um, the eastern side of Lake Anza, in and around the, the picnic area there, and then moving north along, primarily on the East Bay mud side of the fence line along Inspiration Point, working on the grass and brush fields that are to the east uh, of the roadway, uh, or of the, the trail system there, which is all designed to form a big catcher's mitt so that a fire emanating out of these wilderness lands would be not stopped, because we're only talking about the ground component of fire here. The, this fuel break will do nothing to prevent three-dimensional ember cast, I and mean, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But to slow the spread of the ground component of fire for on a north wind through here, or a northeast wind through here to protect all the communities of the East Bay, as well as the communities of La Mirinda along the Highway 24 corridor. And this breaks down by individual parcels. This includes the acreage uh, per parcel. There will be a better version of this on the website so you can see each parcel with greater call out. Uh, for orientation, San Pablo Ridge, the work will stop on a, approximately on an east-west line in alignment with the, the dam for San Pablo Dam. Obviously it ends to the uh, east in vicinity of Akalani's High School on the west side of Pleasant Hill Road and then comes through Inspiration Point which will be in that extension coming down there to the eastern side of Lake Anza will be the western terminus of the project. So really the thing that we're looking to prevent as a fire spreads and as a fire gains size and intensity in the wildland we're able to trade space for time as we aggregate an effective firefighting force to either suppress the fire or slow it enough to execute an effective evacuation. When that fire transitions from the wildland interface into the built up urban areas, and in our case that specifically means El Toyonal, the Downs, Sleepy Hollow and the portions of Lafayette that are on the southern slope of Lafayette Ridge. When that fire transitions down into those built up areas and it gets into an area where the homes are concentrated to the degree that home-to-home -home transmission of fire can occur. When the homes become an available fuel to the fire, the intensity and the speed of the fire increase exponentially and our ability to suppress that fire is vastly diminished both by the, the fire line intensity and the BTUs, but also by the presence of all the residents who are trying to get out of the way of the fire. And, and adding that human factor of untrained, unequipped residents in the middle of a catastrophic fire dramatically reduces our ability to effectively control its spread. Meaning that if a fire transitions out of the wildland into those populated areas, we are probably not going to be able to stop it until conditions change. And the two ways that conditions change are the Malibu model where the fire burns to the Pacific Ocean and goes out, or the Northern California model where the fire burns until the weather changes. And with a Diablo wind event, we have no control over when that weather is going to change. And if you look at, say, the tunnel fire in 1991, it made a dramatic, unstoppable run. And when the wind stopped, the fire stopped. And there was a little bit of spread along the edges after that, but then crews were able to pick it up and put it out. And so what we're doing with this project is we're reducing the likelihood that that initial rate, period of rapid wind-driven spread will spread into the urban areas. And if that initial spread is held up on the, fire, on the fire line we're able to construct or to anchor from the fuel break, we will dramatically reduce the likelihood that this will transition from the wildland to the urban areas. For the, the specs on this, there's 1,515 acres along 14 linear miles, primarily on an east-west axis until we get to Inspiration Point and then it transitions to north-south al along the ridge line there. As I mentioned, it's to protect the communities along the Highway 24 corridor, as well as the communities in the East Bay, really from the Richmond Annex, El Cerrito, Kensington, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and Oakland, and point south, uh, where a fire could spread, having come from the, the wildland areas. The, the fuel break will reduce the threat posed by a gro the ground component of a fire. But as I mentioned before, we'll continue to see three-dimensional ember casts, some of which can be thrown miles in advance of the fire. There is no fuel break we can construct that will be deep enough and broad enough and complete enough that embers will not fly over it. And that's where the point for everyone is that this is not a silver bullet. This is not one thing that says, yay, we won, there is no more fire threat in this area. 
This is one of many things we must do to include the requirement that every resident has prepared, prepared defensible space around their homes, has reduced the prevalence of receptive fuel beds upon which an ember can land and light a fire, and that we are also carrying out detailed fuels mitigation work on large open parcels inside the urban boundaries, all of which represent available fuel that an ember can land in and start a fire that can spread to great size in its own right under those conditions. As I've mentioned several times, I will say it again because I think this is critical to the success of the project, that this is not a fire break. We are not going to run bulldozers through the wilderness knocking down mature trees. This is a shaded fuel break that will largely leave the existing tree canopy intact while focusing the effort on the understory to eliminate brush, grass, and ladder fuels that will allow a ground fire to climb into the canopy where the amounts of available fuel is much greater than that available on the ground and we would see a rapid transition in fire line intensity and spread rates as the fire transitions into the canopy. Do I need to say we're not cutting trees down again? <laughs> Mature trees will be left intact throughout the area of the project with a few exceptions, specifically eucalyptus groves and Monterey pine groves and the areas, the roadside areas along um, Happy Valley Road between Bear Creek and Sundown Terrace. This is a discussion about the transition to ladder fuels. I will suffice it to say that a ground fire does not magically transport itself into the canopy. It needs to have a ladder of available fuels that allow it to move up into the canopy. The reduction of that ladder and the removal of the fuels that allow a fire to transport itself from the air to the canopy is the primary objective, the vast majority of the work that will be done on this project. As an example, this is what a and I say maintained, and that can be maintained by nature or by humans. This is what an example of an unmaintained forest looks like. On the ground, the surface fuels, we have a thick layer of duff. Uh, that is things that can burn that are on the ground anywhere. They do not burn with great intensity in this case, but they do burn persistently. Next, we have ladder fuels, and that provides the vertical continuity that allows a small ground fire that would be easy to suppress and will have a low rate of spread to move up into the canopy. And the thing about the ladder fuels that is so problematic is that their exposure to available oxygen is so much greater because their surface area in that vertical configuration allows a fire to rapidly climb. We have aligned with what fire wants. Heat wants to rise. It needs oxygen to sustain the fire triangle. And it needs fuels. It needs small diameter fuels, all of which are available in great supply there in that middle section. And that then allows the fire to climb, climb into the crown, where if you look at the, the biomass available, with, specifically with foliage in the crown, there's a tremendous amount of fuel lying latent in the air, waiting to be accessed by a ground fire via those ladder fuels. Uh, this is an example off of Wildcat Canyon of what it looks like today. It's, it looks green right now. Uh, in a month to two months or so, it will not look nearly as green. And uh, there's a high decadent component in that brush. There are things over years that have died, but have not decomposed yet and are held upright by all the other vegetation around it, forming ladder fuels. Here's another example along Wildcat Canyon Road. You can see on the right, we have a high concentration of ground fuels. You see above, we see an interlocking canopy over the road. And there's similar fuel accumulations on the opposite side of the road, all of which are enhanced by the fact that this is a mid-slope road with a relatively steep angle approaching it, which will increase fire spread and increase flame length reaching across the road. This is an example from El Toyonal of what the a shaded fuel break looks about five years on. So you'll note that there's the absence of the lower branches on the trees, the trimming and limbing work that was done five years ago. Those lower branches do not regenerate, so that, that is work that will have a persistent benefit. You also note while there's a little bit of regrowth on the ground and there's certainly some duff has accumulated, the regrowth of brush on the ground has been retarded by the consistent presence of that canopy that reduces the amount of sunlight that falls to the forest floor. This is the effect that we are looking for. This is an area where we will come through and do maintenance on this to reduce the regrowth of brush and to clear out some of that duff and ground litter to maintain the good work that was done about five years ago. The example of this car is to say that in a modern car, you are surrounded by a system of safety devices, all of which play a part. The seat belts alone won't do it, a, a energy absorbing bumper, airbags, no one of those components will make the difference. All of them work in concert in a systematic manner to reduce the risk an occupant has of suffering injury during a car crash. I would ask you to think of the same model when it comes to fire safety and to fuels mitigation. This fuel break will be one part of a system that reduces the regional threat. 
And there, in, for the MOFD wildfire strategic plan, there are seven lines of effort. The next most important one behind this, relevant to today's conversation, is work on internal parcels, specifically at the homeowner level, that every homeowner has done defensible space and fuels mitigation work on their parcels. And I've had no shortage of people explain to me with great certainty that doing work on their parcel is not going to make a difference. And they have a picture in their mind of this catastrophic regional fire coming sweeping through and they can't picture how their half acre to an acre of fuels reduction will make a difference. And the answer is, you're kind of right. One parcel by itself will not make the definitive difference. But one parcel by itself used to leverage the neighbors on either side and then the neighbors and all of a sudden 15, 20, 50, 100 homes in a single area have done this work, we have now created an internal fuel break that will not only slow or stop the spread of fire if it transitions into the urban area, but it will also increase the survivability of the homes in that strip, which dramatically increases the survivability profile of any residents who are forced to shelter in their homes because either they were unable or unwilling or unaware of the requirement to evacuate. So there is real work to be done here on a systematic manner, but this project does not in any way relieve the, the community as a whole or our organizations from our obligation to ensure that the other work is being done. And I do not want to put too fine a point on that, but I want to be clear that this is not solving our regional fire problem. This is one step towards that, but there is plenty of other work to be done, and this does not remove that requirement. These are some other things that we are doing and we ask the community to help us with. On the top left, we recently sent out in partnership with the city of Lafayette and Orinda and the town of Moraga and our partners in those police departments and La Marinda search assistance. We recently sent out a wildfire preparedness and evacuation guide. A lot of time and effort has gone into this. This was developed by the community for the community. And I encourage anyone who has an interest in fire safety to take the time to read it. In the top center, the Register for Emergency Alerts, this is the community warning system. In this county, we are tremendously fortunate to have a well-funded, dedicated staff managing our evacuation notification system. If people are signed up for that, that will dramatically increase the likelihood that we will be able to execute timely evacuation notifications, which is critical to our response to a large-scale fire that may exceed our capacity to suppress it. In the center there, they were out today on Minor Road. The MOFD Community Chipper Program is up and running. They are out chipping. And we had two chippers running today along Minor Road and up into the Bear Ridge area. And we encourage folks to do fuels mitigation work and we are eager to partner with them in the reduction of those fuels uh, as they take them down. And on the right side there is, is just a reminder of the Ready, Set, Go evacuation preparedness and the readyforwildfire.org website, which has a tremendous wealth of information about preparing defensible space to increase the survivability profile of a home and anyone who is inside of it. We will also be making use of prescribed fire in targeted areas, specifically on, in the, the Duffel parcel, which is just across Bear Creek Road from the Bear Creek substation, the face of the Briones Dam, and along the, north, the south shoulder of Wildcat Canyon Road. The use of prescribed fire is recommended in those areas as a cost-effective, least environmentally impactful, and appropriate for this environment way to do long-term fuels mitigation at, at, in a manner that is compliant with the natural cycle. We intend to significantly expand MOFD's use of prescribed fire and out years, but this is new for us and we are currently developing the capacity. Last year, uh, we burned approximately 50 acres of prescribed fire. This year, we're moving towards several hundred acres of prescribed fire with the intent to expand that program into the future. Uh, this is a picture of the prescribed fire work we did on the duffel parcel last October, directly across from the Bear Creek substation. The, the thing to note, um, that is as it burned, clearly. If you look at the bottom right, uh, that area was burned four months earlier. And this um, February and March, the area looked like a golf course. It, it regenerated beautifully. The grass was controlled. There was not a lot of dead and dying grass left over from the previous year. And once we burn it for training or otherwise, it will not burn again that year. There is no available fuel left. So it's a very effective manner. The only, the, the equivalent to doing this is to plow it, uh, to physically turn the dirt, which on the East Bay Muds land, that clearly is off the table because of the impact on water quality and runoff. So this is a very, a very low impact way to effectively mitigate fuels. Uh, from an environmental monitoring standpoint, uh, this project is being conducted in conformance with the existing habitat conservation plans on East Bay Parks and East Bay Mudlands. 
on any areas that are not East Bay mud land or East Bay parks, the privately owned parcels, we are going to use the fuels mitigation specifications that apply to East Bay mud land as best practice, as well as those lands, all the private lands are immediately adjacent to East Bay mud, so the runoff will be traveling into their watershed. So it made sense that we would use their specification for those lands since there was not an existing specification in place. All of these will be designed to reduce the impact on special status species, both flora and fauna, in compliance and overseen by qualified biologists. Uh, the archaeologists will have done their work before we do anything to identify any sensitive sites. And then the uh, environmental review will be ongoing to ensure that we do not violate either active nesting or any of the components of the habitat conservation plans. Uh, this is go, no go for us. If there are sensitive areas, we will just either go around them or we'll come up with an alternate method that does not violate that. The landowners, East Bay Parks and East Bay Mud, are very clear that they're going to continue to be the landowners after this project is done. And anything they do that deviates from their existing requirements will have serious ramifications and implications for their ability to conduct their future stewardship and fuels mitigation programs. The point of that is to say that everything we're going to be doing on this project is going to be in compliance with their existing plans and overseen by qualified biologists, archaeologists, and um, registered forester who will be involved with any tree reduction to make sure that it's being done in the appropriate manner. We intend uh, to start burning in June. The rain obviously has, uh, has caused that into question to a degree. Things have to cure before they can burn. But there's an intent to start early portions of the project with prescribed fire. And the reason for that is we have a very narrow window in coastal California where we are within prescription for fire. Too early and the fuels are still, they haven't cured, they're still green, they, they will not burn, or if they burn, they, they'll burn in an incomplete manner. Too late, we are into fire season when we are not going to put fire on the ground because that would not be responsible. And in the middle, we have to stay in compliance with Bay Area air quality standards, which means there are some days the Bay Area quality says you cannot burn because of an air quality management issue. So we have a very narrow window in the Mediterranean counties of California in which to pr conduct prescribed fire. And we intend to take advantage of that, and, and that means the prescribed fire will be some of the earlier portions of the project. The, there are areas of the work specifically on Happy Valley Road, uh, as well as on Wildcat Canyon that will require periodic road closures. The crews doing the work in that area will need that space to marshal equipment, and as a material handling deck, those road closures will be coordinated through County Roads, who's the responsible entity in those areas. There'll be ample notice posted, and we will minimize impact outside of commute hours, because we understand people need to get to and from work regardless of this project. And additionally, there may be some temporary trail closures in the wilderness areas as work passes through there to minimize the potential for impact between recreational users and the equipment and crews that will be conducting work in those areas. Uh, with that, that is the overview. Um, Dennis, if you want to start with the questions, and we'll go from there. Okay, number one, I highly commend your proactive efforts to make Orinda safer. Will you take before and after photos of the fuel break uh, activities so private property owners can see what to do on their properties? So the answer to that question is yes. We certainly will do everything we can to capture the progress. We're also working to get, capture a pre-work uh, LIDAR image of both the canopy and the understory and a post-work LIDAR image so that we can update our fire spread models and we can then we can see what the impacts were and that will also drive recommendations about where future fuels mitigation work should, do, should be conducted as we see the areas where a fire is most likely uh, to jump the fuel break and additional work would be recommended in out years along those areas. Okay, I have several about the Wagner Ranch uh, nature area. Uh, the first one, and maybe I'll lump a couple of these together. Could the fire break be achieved by tackling the north side of Bear Creek Road, East Bay Mudland, instead of the nature area? So the, specifically on the nature area at Wagner Ranch, the, the property owner in that case is the school district. And, and we defer to the school district on, on what they are and are not willing to 
allowed to be done on their land as we do with all of the other private property owners. The specification that would be called for use on that land is the East Bay Mud specification. The specific recommendation has to do with the reduction of the annual grasses, breaking up the heavy accumulations of brush that are in and around the nature area, and targeting the specifically the dead or dying non-native tree species, some of which are present in that area. To what degree that occurs and, and how far or how thorough that work is, I, I defer to the landowner on, on what they will allow. Okay, carrying on with the Wagner Ranch nature area questions. The use of heavy equipment such as a masticator would plow through the nature area, potentially damaging, damaging historical artifacts, native heritage, native and heritage plants. Can work be done without that type of equipment? And, and there are at least four eucalyptus trees in the nature area that were planted in the 1880s. We would appreciate your help in getting them removed. And uh, we wonder if there will be work done in the nature area during the summer camp, June 10th through August 2nd. Will, camp, will the camp be disturbed by trucks and workers coming and going? And uh, the Friends of Wagner Ranch Nature Area Board of Directors includes uh, Professor Emeritus Ray Barrett, uh, an expert in wildlife management who will be willing to offer a walkthrough of the, of the area to identify important historical educational habitat that should be preserved. That's it for the answer? That's it. Okay. So uh, once again, we, we defer to the property owners and what they will and will not allow. Obviously, all of the project areas will be confirmed by archaeologists that it is, there are no protected or sensitive sites in those areas in any work that will be done in uh, proximity to those sites will be done under their supervision and approval. Um, specific to ground disturbance, all of the work is designed to reduce the ground disturbance in order to minimize the impact on runoff, specifically in the East Bay Mud and East Bay Mud runoff areas, and that applies to this parcel as well. Uh, and with regard um, to the member of the board and his expertise, I, I defer to the landowner on, on who they would like to have represent them. Next question is, when will you start working on the shaded pool break, and when will you be finished? Do we have deadlines? So with my gratitude to whoever wrote that for the inclusion of the appropriate term. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so the shaded fuel break work will start um, when the contracting process that the state is currently undergoing is completed. So the state has not completed their review and finalization of the contract. We're waiting to receive that from the state. When we do, uh, we will mobilize as soon as possible thereafter. We are in prime fuel mitigation season as of when that rain stopped, and we want to get the vast majority of the work done, particularly the portions involving hand crews and the use of small power equipment. We want to get the vast majority of that work done as early as possible in the season to reduce the potential for an inadvertent fire start were we to transition into fire season proper. If we are in a red flag or extreme fire weather danger period, there will be no work conducted on the project. So it is advantageous from our perspective to get it underway as soon as possible to avoid that overlap of those dry, hot, windy, humid, non uh, low humidity conditions that we expect to see in the fall. With regard to deadline, uh, the state has been very clear that this project needs to be completed by December 31st, 2019. And that was the intent of these projects and the reason that ours along with the other 34 that made up the list were moved forward was the belief that they were well positioned to be completed this year and would not require years of extensive planning, which is in alignment with the governor's intent that work be done that can make a difference now, and we are committed to making that timeline. Okay, how many homes are in the El Toynel Road uh, drainage? 200. Right. How many homes need to I, think, I believe it's approximately 200, but I can, uh, I can certainly confirm that. Um, I will say this, the, the homes in El Toyonal, uh, 200 or it's, it's, some, it's something close to 200, significantly exceed the capacity of that road network for those residents to rapidly move out of that area. Okay, next question is, will the tree canopy over Wildcat Canyon Road be eliminated? I, I, eliminate is not the right word, but there, there are elements of um, branches, not whole trees, that will certainly be trimmed back or pruned to try to daylight the, over the road. An interlocking canopy over a road is problematic for a number of reasons, having to do with fire spread, but our primary focus is going to be on the reduction of the ladder fuels that will allow a fire to climb into that canopy in the first place, and then the reduction of the duff in the, in the remaining or residual understory on the south side of the road through the introduction of prescribed fire. 
Okay, um, California now has its own strict Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Will this project adhere to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife requirements for this same, um, for the State Migratory Bird Treaty Act? And will the project leaders support funding for area-wide defensible space actions and yearly management actions? And will the project leaders support baseline studies of impacts to sensitive habitat and special status species including oh boy I can't I can't read the writing but something after study models so basically the monitoring question sure so uh, in answer to the the first question uh, the the nesting bird uh, requirements will be are, will apply to this and will be followed that includes a biologist walking through within two weeks prior to the work beginning when you're nesting bird season that includes additional biological monitoring requirements to ensure that nesting birds are not um, disturbed or uh, caused to move during their critical nesting period. Um, for defensible space work in private parcels outside the project area, uh, that is not uh, a part of this project. Uh, that is not part of what the state is funding. We will continue to engage with private parcel owners and the, rel the various and relevant HOAs and other community groups to encourage homeowners and um, residents to do the work on their parcel, but this project does not include a component for that. Um, and then having to do with the pre and post monitoring, uh, we will be following the requirements that the stewardship councils and landowners for East Bay Mud, East Bay Parks have an effect and make sure this work is conducted in compliance uh, with that work. And I, I defer to Parks and East Bay Mud about pre and post uh, monitoring. Do you want to talk about that, Scott? Or? Sure. If I may. Scott Hill, the East Bay Mud Watershed Manager. The, you know, one of the main components that will be employed during the project is avoidance of any areas where there are species of special concern. And we're anticipating by doing that that there really won't be any post-project monitoring required. Um, but to the extent, if there is, if, if, if there is uh, monitoring required, that would be a component of the project that we would adhere to, yes. Very good. Uh, I think this was basically just answered, but just for the sake of going over it. For biological surveys, will you also pre-survey for sensitive native plant communities, such as perennial native grasslands? Correct. So the, the requirements for both flora and fauna uh, are, will be adhered to here. Um, and the, the project is intended to be in compliance with the existing specifications for both East Bay Parks, East Bay Mud, as I mentioned before, with the East Bay Mud specifications being utilized for the private parcels that, that aren't covered by East Bay Parks requirements. Okay, and then the East Bay Regional Park District's wildfire plan retains lower level fuel understory native trees and shrubs such as coast live oak and toyon when removing decadent pines, acacia, etc. Will you be keeping understory lower fuel native vegetation uh, in these circumstances? So specific to East Bay Parks, I, I defer to the East Bay Parks team. The work there will be overseen by East Bay Parks Ranger. Um, they're creating a dedicated position to oversee this work and it'll be conducted in accordance with their specification. The work in the um, Monterey Pine Forest on uh, East Bay Parks land is all, has been pre-planned, pre-approved, has been through their process and it'll be conducted in accordance with those requirements. Um, then there's two questions that basically uh, try and address existing problems, so I'll put those both together. Uh, the first one is a, a large pile of flammable uh, garbage along Bear Creek Road. Who can I call to address this? I'll be here after the meeting. Um, and will you do any work along Bear Creek Road between Briones Reservoir and the north end of Dalewood Drive, the, down, the downs, and the fire trail that extends from the end of Dalewood Drive down to Bear Creek Road? Uh, correct. The, the project <clears throat> excuse me, is intended to follow the north side of Orinda View uh, to the end of the road there up to the East Bay Mud Reservoir on the slight knoll and then there's a fire trail that extends down to um, Bear Creek Road, an additional fire trail system that makes its way around to the eastern side of the Sleepy Hollow Swim and Tennis Club. So in that area, uh, specifically, presenter faux pas, I never walked to your screen. Uh, Right here is the intersection of Arinda View and um, Happy Valley Road, and the project runs along here, along that ridge line to provide a second line of defense in light of 
how heavy the vegetation is on this slope and how inaccessible it is because of the vegetation loading and the steepness. So what, what that's intended to do is establish a defense in depth with the fuels mitigation work along Bear Creek Road here and the work along Orinda View here is intended to create a layered defense in light of both the, the slope and the, the fuel loading as well as how isolated um, that, those 18 homes are on Orinda View and really designed to give us an opportunity to anchor on that ridge because if a fire were to crest that ridge and move down into the downs proper, uh, the evacuation problem, the fire spread problem grows exponentially and that ridge is our last best chance to hold a fire before it transitions into the heavily populated areas where we'd start to see house to house transmission and the availability of homes as fuel. So to answer the question, yes, uh, the project will move along a rind of view um, down to Bear Creek Road along the existing fire trail and building up along the good work that the HOA has done up there to reduce understory, uh, take down some of the brush and grass over the last several years through a significant investment of HOA funds. I'm afraid I don't know where that is, but maybe after we could take a look at the map and you can help me better understand that. Thank you. This one's from a Moraga resident that's concerned, has concern regarding trees that are overgrown and close to the power lines uh, along Moraga Way and Moraga Road, Glorietta uh, to Lafayette. Um, and to summarize that they're concerned about is the district concerned about those trees and what are we doing about them? And will they be included in, in future fuel break efforts? So the, the district's very concerned about the encroachment of vegetation on the evacuation routes for Moraga and Orinda. Uh, this project does not move beyond the highlighted areas. Uh, there's no work south of 24 that's envisioned as work where most of those areas are. The district continues to do door-to-door um, -door visits with the property owners who's along whose property those easements travel. Uh, last year, we walked the length of Moraga Road and issued a number of um, recommendations. I would say, just anecdotally, about a third of the folks complied. This year, in February and March, we did the same thing along Moraga Road, Minor Way, Minor Road, Moraga Way, and Gl Glorietta and Ream. We went back 30 days later at the end of April and conducted follow-ups, and I would say it's early in the season yet, so we weren't issuing citations, but approximately 80% of the parcel owners had done no work since we had previously come. We will be back on June 16th, the day following um, our requirement for annual work to be done, and we'll be issuing red tag citations along those evacuations at that time. And that will be an awful lot of citations unless um, the pace of work on those privately owned parcels increases dramatically. So to answer the question, yes, the district is very concerned uh, about the encroachment of vegetation along those evacuation routes because it, it does not take a, any level of detailed analysis to suggest the population exceeds our streets and I think we see that validated twice a day during rush hour and anything that reduces the effective width of those roads and decreases their effectiveness as a place that fire will be hung up trying to cross we're very concerned about. The only thing I would I would say is, and as you drive Moraga Way if you take a look on both sides of that road every one of those parcel owners has had several knocks on the door and at least three things show up in the mail. Okay, and then there's two uh, questions here that are, I'm going to lump together, or at least give them both to you at the same time. They're related to evacuation, um, and the plug that I'll make is tomorrow night we'll be here with a panel discussion with the uh, Marinda's Chief of Police, Chief Winokur, and Duncan Seibert from uh, La Marinda CERT to talk specifically about um, pre preparation for evacuation. But the questions are, you said 200 homes would need to be evacuated on the road that would only ho handle would not handle all 200, how would you handle that? And the other question is, will La Marinda residents be encouraged to have slash buy bicycles, motorized scooters for evacuation purposes? Those, those are areas to which there is no good answer. Our attempt, there is no way to get more people out of, uh, a road will handle a finite number of people per hour and that's it. So our primary plan is to prevent a fire from getting there and that's the fuel break and our um, the seven lines of effort on our strategic wildfire prevention plan are designed to reduce the requirement to do that. The second thing is to, if the road will handle a finite number of cars per hour, which it will, we increase the number of hours which we have to process that traffic through early notification and early um, evacuation orders. And then we hope through education, outreach, and a belief in the threat that the residents will take those seriously and evacuate rapidly. 
What we have seen in the large-scale fires of the last several years is there is a percentage of residents in every area that do not evacuate until the last second. And at the last second, particularly in El Toyonal, there are not a whole lot of other options on how to get out. We will also be trying to move a large number of firefighting apparatus up those same roads. And it, it doesn't take uh, much more than a tape measure to figure out that just the physics don't work on fire engines up, people out, especially at the same time if we take smoke and embers down to the ground, we add uh, a sense of urgency, and that road's going to be very problematic. There are no circumstances under which I recommend evacuating on a bicycle, on a scooter, or on foot. Uh, between the smoke, the traffic, and the other vehicles, uh, I think that is a very low percentage move. A, the recommendation for El Toy now, and I, I've spoken with the residents up there on several occasions now, is do defensible space work around the homes, harden the homes through retrofits and upgrades to reduce the likelihood that a fire will move through there rapidly. And that really starts with individual parcel fuels mitigation. We will continue to do the work in the surrounding areas to reduce the threat of a, the ground component of a fire. But an, an ember, a single ember landing in a pile of dry leaves, will start another fire on the opposite side of this fuel break. And then it becomes just a simple math problem of road width, curve angle, and number of people we are trying to get out to say that that will be a very real problem for which there is no easy answer. OK, and then I had uh, one request from uh, Norm, Norman LaForce from the Sierra Club Public Lands Committee to make a brief comment. So I'll let me bring you the mic, Norm. Uh, thanks, Dennis. I appreciate the opportunity to make a few comments. I've been involved with this issue as, since after the 1991 fire in Oakland. So it's been now a, over a quarter century I've been working on this issue. I and a number of other people were instrumental in getting the Park District to do its own vegetation management program. Um, I affectionately call it Vegematic. Um, and a number of things I think are important, and one is that uh, and I, th I know you guys are doing a great job here, trying to do a good job. But um, the, a problem I see is uh, there's, where's the money for the ongoing maintenance? Because this types of vegetation management require m maintenance in perpetuity. Not simply just a few years down the line, but in perpetuity. Um, and that can be very expensive. Um, so I would hope that after this is done that you all get together and get the governor to give you all the money to do the maintenance in perpetuity. Secondly, I am disturbed, the club is disturbed, that there is no environmental impact analysis that's going to be done. I appreciate the efforts you're doing, uh, and, uh, but when, we, when the Park District did its program, uh, it originally didn't want to do an environmental impact report. Uh, we got it to do it. And out of that actually came a lot of valuable information that actually benefited how they did their vegetation management program. So an EIR is not simply a waste of money, as I think the governor's uh, exemption for it is an implicit assumption that, that, that the EIR is going to be a waste of time and money. Um, and I would hope that you would do more than just what you're doing, which is great, on the, in, in monitoring and taking care of the environmental issues. Um, third, there are going to be areas where there's the eucalyptus groves, and those need to be removed. Eucalyptus, the blue gum eucalyptus, is one of the most fire dangerous trees that exists. Uh, just go on YouTube and check out Australia and see what happens there. Um, and so those need to be removed. Thinning eucalyptus is not a solution. It cre creates a far greater cost to maintain because eucalyptus release all kinds of, of, of duff over the time each year and it needs to be it tons and pounds and pounds of it. So they need to be removed where, where you can do it and replaced with natural, na the native habitat. Uh, lastly, uh, it's important to note that this is not elimination of risk, okay? There's no way we can eliminate the fire risk this is like the earthquakes. I can earthquake my home, which I've done. The earthquake comes, I'm within a half mile of the fault. Uh, my home may still go down, okay? And what's important and what's actually been shown to be effective is actually how individual homeowners fire hardening their homes uh, to protect them. You'll, you can see a lot of visuals of fires in other parts of California where people have fire hardened their homes and their home survives. While, while a home that wasn't fire hardened does not survive. 
That doesn't mean that you're going to survive any fire, and we know from Paradise that when a fire gets going, it can be pretty bad. But one of the best examples, and I don't know how many uh, wood shaped roofs still exist in this area, but a wood shaped roof is, roof is one of the worst things you can still keep on your property, on your house. Uh, you, there's great videos, you go on YouTube again, of fires, and particularly in Southern California, where the houses that had wood shake roofs are gone, while next, right next door, the, the house that had the, 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 more, the, the, the concrete roof and the, the brick roof, the kind of fire hardened roofs, survived, okay? Right next door to each other. So that's, that's the important thing. But those are a few things I'd like to comment on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Norman. Uh, one last question while I head back up here. Uh, East Bay Mud and East Bay Regional Parks have experts to monitor environmental issues. The school district does not have a biologist or bio expert who will uh, monitor Wagner Ranch uh, will it, and will the specifications be East Bay Mud or East Bay Regional Parks? So all lands other than East Bay Parks will be utilizing the East Bay Mud specification and all project work will be supervised by qualified biologists. We're hiring contract biologists to do just that. They work in conjunction with staff on East Bay Parks, East Bay Mudland. They'll use that same, those same requirements, the same specification, the same concerns for work on Wagner as well as any of the other privately owned parcels. Okay, at, at this point, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we'll be here for as long as it takes. If you have specific questions about specific issues, happy to answer those. Um, we appreciate your time, and we look forward to keeping you up to speed as the project progresses. Thank you very much. Thank you.